Patrick Peterson is on IR. We got to talk about what that means, and we got to take all of your questions here on Twitter Tuesday on the Locked On Vikings podcast. You are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, your pal, and the kid you copied off in math class. My name is Luke Braun. You can find me on Twitter at Luke Braun NFL, and the show is on Twitter at Locked on Vikings. Thank you so much for making Locked on Vikings your first listen of the day. And today's episode is brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's an unofficial community center. A big thank you to our friends at McDonald's for always being there. I'm loving it. So today is Twitter Tuesday. That means y'all sent me your questions. If you have a question for Twitter Tuesday, you can DM it to me anytime on Twitter at Luke Braun NFL or at Locked On Vikings, or you can send an email to Locked On Vikings Podcast at gmail.com, or you can fill out the Google form in the show notes. You can leave a comment on YouTube or Discord if you want. Just put it wherever I can find it, and I'll try to get, get to your question. I usually put out a call for them on Mondays. We're going to uh, tackle the new news of the day, of course, which is the Patrick Peterson news via a couple of mailbag questions, because I think there's two big thoughts we all have to kind of uh, process through here. And the first one is, do they have cap space to trade for a cornerback to cover Patrick Peterson? And if so, what options are out there? That c- came from Jump Ball James. Um, and so, okay, so here's the deal. If you missed it, Patrick Peterson suffered a hamstring injury late in the fourth quarter of the Panthers game. He goes on IR. He said on his podcast that he says he can like barely walk. And then the doctor said like, you'll be out like a month. So like a month, I guess, is the timetable that we got from Peterson himself on the podcast, which is more than we almost ever get from the podium. All Mike Zimmer was willing to say is that it's not season ending, um, which he said with a fair degree of confidence. So something like that going on IR, he has to miss three games, um, not three weeks, which I learned. I thought it was three weeks, but I guess they changed it to three games specifically. So the bye week doesn't count. So Cowboys, Chargers, Ravens, no Patrick Peterson. And that's a few teams you want Patrick Peterson against. So yeah, we get to the idea of like, well, can we trade for someone? For someone who's genuinely good, like somebody who would start over Dantzler and Breland. So we're not just taking somebody's random cast off they were going to cut or whatever, or somebody's fifth corner. We're getting somebody that would start and be good. They have a little less than $3.5 million in cap space, so probably not. And the other thing is Mike Zimmer was asked the same question, and his answer was, eh, now we feel good about our guys. Um, so I don't think they're going to make any kind of move. Um, I don't think they have the cap space to make any kind of move. They'd have to, you know, pay extra draft capital to get the other team to like take on some of the the salary as they send the player away or something like that. It'd be this really big, messy thing. I, I don't think they're very interested in doing that. Um, so and I don't think he was just like gassing up his players to like help a trade negotiation either. Like, I don't I just don't think they're into it. So I think they're just going to go with Dantzler and Breland for the next three games. That's your depth. That's what depth is for. Guys get hurt. Next man up. That's how the NFL works. Uh, Caleb Andrews asks, how are the Vikings going to cover anyone now that Peterson is out? How does Zimmer adjust? Will he adjust? Um, So last part first, he will definitely adjust. On defense, Zimmer adjusts constantly. He has thrown out different defenses week to week, let alone season to season or as personnel changes. Um, He was running a lot of cover four kind of because it fits Patrick Peterson very well. So you might see different coverage shells or you might see different things. You might see more cover too if they don't trust the cornerbacks as much. He doesn't trust Breland as much as he trusts Patrick Peterson. The thing about man match coverage is you can kind of give each player their own set of rules and you just have to fit those rules together so that, you know, so there's some always somebody to pick up whatever a cornerback is passing off. So I, I don't know. I guess specifically the answer that I would advocate would be switching out cover two for cover four but maybe not as much. It kind of depends on how much you trust those corners, which is going to be something that, um, you know, D-backs coaches and the defensive staff and Zimmer himself are going to kind of have to feel out. They've got the whole bye week to kind of figure something out with this. Daniel Chase asks, Pierce didn't go on IR, and we never heard the results of the MRI that I recall. Any chance we get him back for Dallas? Um, So that's a pretty good theory. Uh, That he didn't go on IR is fairly significant. The if Michael Pierce did go on IR, it would have opened up a roster spot and you could have elevated somebody, but all they did was put another guy on the practice squad. Um, so that sort of implies that they at least thought he was going to, he had a chance to be ready within three weeks. Um, and I guess the bye week also counts there. So yeah, it, 
there's definitely a chance. I don't know really any more than any of you know about it because we didn't hear the results of the MRI and there's been no reporting or anything like that. So we kind of just have to wait and see. But sure, there's a shot. Um, Vikings129 says, thoughts on Joe Brady's play calling this week. Do you see him as a, as a potential Zimmer replacement? Um, so this is the question that I chose to have the, the quick coach fire conversation. Um, he's obviously not getting fired. I think if he was, I would know by the time of this recording, we would have probably seen it by now. And I think the window kind of slams shut on firing him mid season. I mean, anything can happen. You know, you go zero and four over the next few games and we have the conversation again. Um, but I think if you are now firing Zimmer, you're doing it after the Vikings are mathematically eliminated. That's the next kind of big milestone. Or if something goes really, 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 really bad, like a John Gruden problem, uh, or, uh, you know, like a five game blowout losing streak or something super embarrassing and horrific. But I think if they just remain mediocre, Zimmer probably stays the head coach and you just have the conversation at the end of the year. Um, in terms of Joe Brady, I don't have a lot of opinions on him. It's really hard to evaluate his play calling because I thought Sam Darnold anchored it a lot and not anchored like kept it in place, but dragged it, anchored like dragged it down. Um, I think he just made bad reads. He made everything take too long. And I don't know. I, I, I ask me again once I've seen the tape. Maybe I'll see like, wow, Carolina did a bunch of dumb stuff. I don't like it or whatever. But it seemed like Sam Darnold makes it really difficult to evaluate the play calling. Uh, Nick Howard says, why for is Udo still playing? <laughs> uh, so this is another really, really big talker. So Oli Udo had a really rough game on Sunday. He struggled again with covered and uncovered, uh, with knowing who to block. He, uh, gave up, I think three old penalties, two or three holding penalties. Uh, so really rough game for Oli Udo. And I don't know if you're going to see him against Dallas. Again, we're on the bye week now, so we have time to sit and think about things where we can have them practice, although usually the Vikings let the players have that time off to like rest and recoup. Um, but you still have the next practice coming up. You can try Wyatt Davis. We'll see if Wyatt Davis knows things. The bye week is always very helpful. You're not preparing for an opponent, so you just have time to drill crap you're not good at yet. Um, so you might see Wyatt Davis, or you might see a rotation or something like the same way they did it with Derisaw, although the reason they did it that way with Derisaw is because he did not have a lot of practices thanks to his injury. Wyatt Davis has been practicing in full since the first week of preseason, so I don't know if a rotation would be as appropriate for him. I don't, there's totally a chance that he doesn't play at this point. I think Udo has... Uh, used up his leash. A lot of people ask some version of the question is, has how much leash does Oli Udo get? For me, if I were in the room, I would say he's used it up. I don't know if the Vikings want to be a little more patient. I would be totally sympathetic to that too. I've got a whole bunch more questions that I want to talk to you about. But first, uh, I want to tell you a stupid story um, from when I was in high school. I did mock trial. It was in the debate slash speech family of more academic after school activities because I'm a huge nerd. And every, I did it all, all four years of high school and every, I think it was Tuesdays and Thursdays was when we would, we would get together and meet. And every Tuesday and Thursday, it was someone's turn to go out and get McDonald's. And every time I go past that particular McDonald's in my hometown, I think about all those good memories. McDonald's is more than just a place to get affordable, tasty food. It's memories. It's togetherness. It's a place where you can rest up, recharge. You can stop off on a long road trip, rest your legs, refuel, all of that stuff. So head out to your local McDonald's to refuel and reconnect. Thank you so much to our friends at McDonald's for always being there. I'm loving it. Moving on with this Twitter Tuesday mailbag, the next one comes from Nano Garces, who says, in your opinion, what is the cause of the difference in the play call between the first and second half? So the first half was bad, I guess, for most of it. The second half was good. Um, I don't know if there was a huge difference in play calling. I'm going to have to table this question. I, you know, I've, like, I haven't seen the All-22 tape yet, and I haven't really logged it yet. Um, so I don't know what really plays they run. You can't see the route concepts. Um, so I have to table this till tomorrow, but what I will say is a lot of the, the really bad offense in the second quarter and third quarter was penalties and bad execution and stuff like that. Um, you know, pressure and, and just sort of general disaster stuff, Kirk Cousins falling over and throwing later laterals out of bounds and stuff. Um, so I don't know. I f felt like it was more execution than play calling, but let me get back to you on that one. Uh, Obi-Juan Kenobi says, I've seen how highly graded Armin Watts is six weeks into the season, and it's been a pleasant surprise. What have you seen from his game that contributed to his emergence? Um, I don't know if I fully agree with PFF here. Um, I, I've seen a lot of bad from Armin Watts. I've seen him get washed out of the plays a lot. I, I've blamed him a lot for the run defense problems. Um, a, a lot like early in the season, 
when Michael Pierce would go out, like I, I just go back to week one. It was hot and Michael Pierce couldn't play that many snaps because he's a big, big boy and it was hot out. Um, and Armin Watts would come in and when Armin Watts would come in, they'd give up a huge run play. Michael Pierce would come back in and the run, the run game would, would kind of cinch back up. Um, and uh, it's hard for me to get that out of my head because that was kind of what I noticed for the first few games. And then the run defense really, really struggled against the Lions with no Michael Pierce. It was rough. So, uh, I don't know if I agree with that with Armin Watts. I will say, however, his pass rushes do look more polished and he's getting pressure and uh, he got a sack in this game, right? So his pass rushes look more polished. He's got more moves. He's got more, he's, he's pass rushing with a plan instead of just kind of firing off and kind of sinking into some guard's arms. He's, you know, swimming and he's doing pass rush moves and he's really got more of a developed plan, which is really exciting. Kyle Omphet says, I personally don't have an issue with the play calling for the most part. I think Clint has been solid, but my issue comes in mid to late fourth quarter when you get conservative with a lead. Why don't they trust Kirk to close out games when he has proven he clearly can when we have needed? Um, so I'm going to push back on the idea that they don't trust Kirk Cousins. I see this a lot. I got a bunch of questions. When will they finally trust Kirk Cousins? I mean... They called a 30-yard corner route with the game on the line, right? And then he delivered it. Like, they... I, I There are a few decisions that have been too conservative, but I don't want to come to an assumption about what the Vikings are thinking and why. And and, and we do this a lot. I see a lot of this, and, and this really annoys me because it seems very inconsistent. When the offense does something well, we, uh, we credit the player, we credit Clint Kubiak, we probably should and all that. When the offense does something poor, when they're conservative, when a play doesn't work or something... There's a lot of assumption that it's Mike Zimmer, that that when the offense, you know, runs on second and long, that Clint Kubiak didn't call that play. That was Mike Zimmer getting in Clint Kubiak's ear and saying, you run here now. You do it. I'm going to strong arm you. And Clint Kubiak withering in the fetal position says, OK, I'll call a run. Like, that's not how it happens. And that's like either Mike Zimmer is influencing the offense or he isn't. And if he is, then he owns the good and the bad of it. And if he isn't, then he doesn't own the good and the bad of it. And then that's on Clint or whoever messed up and stuff. And I hate speculating on this because we're not in those rooms and we aren't listening to those conversations. So that's why I prefer, like, my analysis is always going to be, okay, what player screwed up? What was the play call? What were they supposed to do? Why didn't it work? Um, and, and I prefer to do that because it's what I can see and it's what I can understand. But if we want to speculate, like, what evidence do we have that Mike Zimmer is strong arming every offensive coordinator into running a lot because Gary Kubiak loved the run. I mean, do you know his history pre Vikings? He loved that. So it's not like, you know, Mike Zimmer had to, if he wanted to run, he wouldn't have had anything to, to say there. Um, but like with Clint Kubiak, like the only thing I can remember is in 2018, the, the game that basically got John Filippo fired, um, was, or got him like on the hottest of hot seats was the Patriots game in 2018. You might remember this one. The Vikings ran the ball nine times for nine yards of carry. So they, the run game was awesome and they never used it. Um, and everybody was like, why didn't they run? That's terrible. Fire John Filippo. And ultimately it came out that Mike Zimmer wanted John Filippo to run, to run more and said, Hey, look, it's working, run more. And John Filippo said no and went insubordinate, and he got fired for that. Or they gave him one last chance in the Seahawks game after that, and then he got fired after that. And that has stuck in people's minds as now the thing that happens every single time a, an offensive coordinator wants to pass the ball. A, run pass is not play calling. Play calling is plays, not just do you run or do you pass. There's more to it than that. But B... I think, and, and Zimmer has even come out and said, we need to be more aggressive sometimes. You know, I would rather this, I would rather that. Like, it doesn't seem to me like he it, it, like he's demanding this much of the offense. Um, and I think the offense has historically been more aggressive in the years like 2017 Shermer year or the 2019 Stefanski year when he was more involved because those guys were less trustworthy than, say, Norv Turner or Gary Kubiak. That's my theory on Zimmer. In terms of the conservatism, that is Zimmer. I think when it comes to this is a game situation, he is the one saying, let's play for a field goal. And then Clint Kubiak is the one calling which run play it is or whatever. That's what I think about the conservatism, at least what I think is going on here. But I don't really want to assume anything any deeper than that until I hear about it, uh, until somebody reports about it, until we know about it. I think it's kind of inappropriate to kind of just say, anytime the offense does something conservative, well, that's Zimmer. And anytime they do something aggressive, haha, they overcame Zimmer. And it's like, well, you don't know what conversation was had at all or who advocated for what. You're just kind of going with the thing you heard three years ago and applying it to every single situation going forward. Um, 
And I do think they trust Kirk Cousins. I think in the third and eight, the mistake they made was playing for the field goal, not necessarily a dichotomy between trusting Kirk Cousins or not, but more that they were playing for a field goal into the wind, making the field goal range shorter. But like if their field goal range in that situation was two yards away from the line of scrimmage and they said, okay, we just need to run for two here. You can kind of start thinking about it as a third and two. And then you take out your third and two playbook and there's a run there. And then Madison Bork the run and then, you know, they punt. Um, that is, uh, that's terrible, but there's an execution mistake there. And then there's a, you know, if your problem is treating that third and eight, like a third and two, I totally get that. But I think that is more of a game situation error than it is about like trusting one player or another. That was a really long rant. I got a whole bunch more questions to get to, but first I want to talk to you about the beach. Look, it's getting chilly (laughs) or it's going to start getting chilly at least, uh, in the North. And in life, we are all bound for different things, like perhaps the beach. With beachbound.com vacations, you can be bound for adventure, passion, bound for discovery or togetherness, bound for immersion, bound for rejuvenation, or maybe you are bound for encountering the unexpected. With beachbound.com, you can find the perfect beach vacation for you, your perfect winter getaway, all you snowbirds, no matter what you are looking for. So what are you bound for? Visit beachbound.com today. Speaking of the coming winter months, do you have a good ice scraper in your car? Because if you've you've ever been stuck in a parking lot or even on the side of the road and that, that first rain froze on your windshield and you can't scrape it off, that's like super dangerous. You can get that or you can get any other supplies you might need for your safety in the winter months, like jumper cables or a flashlight or whatever. You can get all that stuff at Rock auto.com or you can get other parts for your car if you're a fix it up kind of person or maybe you're going to a mechanic and you want to buy the part yourself to save a little bit of money rock auto can help you just enter your make your year and your model and uh, rock auto's big giant catalog will sort all the way through itself do all the research for you and get you a part that is compatible with your car whatever you end up buying at rockauto.com you're going to save a buck versus a mechanic or a brick and mortar auto shop those guys are going to upcharge you rock auto is a family company they've been doing this for 20 years online they know how to make a buck without making you suffer for it so head on over to rockauto.com whatever you buy Enter in the How You Heard About Us section at checkout that Locked On sent you. Because if you don't, ZD and Zoe are going to break up over financial issues. Rock Auto, amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. So moving on with this Twitter Tuesday mailbag here on the Locked On Vikings podcast. Thank you so much for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day, by the way. George asks, can you explain or try to what has made Kirk's play different this season? Um, So I can try. But the the thing you have to know about Kirk Cousins is that he is, by nature, inconsistent. And he's been pretty consistent this year, and that's been awesome. But through his whole career, he has been, he has had plenty of stretches like this. You remember Kirk Tober in 2019, like that 2019 Eagles game and Lions game where he was just dealing, um, and he was just playing phenomenally. And then you remember maybe October of 2020, where he was playing terribly, and he was throwing, in, you know, three interceptions a game and um, taking dumb sacks, and there were fumbles and all that stuff. You know, you remember the disaster games um, and, and crazy, crazily conservative, you know, check down Kirk games. And so he just is a different guy every single week. And so what's different about this season is we haven't had the like really crazy bad games. I've had some where I actually do not like his his play. I, he's had some check down games for me, as evidenced by the chaos meter. But uh, if he can keep this kind of play up throughout the entire season, I think that would be a first for him. Um, and it would lead to some really gaudy stats and he would probably break a lot of personal records and stuff like that. And that would be really awesome. Um, but I, I do think he's a little better at working the pocket. He even said on a, on the podium, um, on Monday, he said he thinks he's improving. Um, and I, it's hard to disagree. I think he is getting better at certain things that he's like really set out to work on, like making plays under pressure and improvising a little bit better and stuff. He's getting more consistent at that. And that's really, really, really nice. Um, but it's kind of, uh, he has too much of a reputation for being way worse than he was the week before for me to not trust it until this kind of stays consistent for a long, long time. And there's only one way to find out, right? Uh, Cho says, is there a scenario where Cousins gets replaced by Mond? Would they do that if they were mathematically eliminated in, say, week 13? Or should I just root for COVID? Never root for COVID. Um, So I I do think the only situation would have to be um, Kirk Cousins is, for one reason or another, unavailable. And that would make Kellen Mond active. And then in that game, Sean Mannion gets hurt. Kellen Mond goes in the game. That's the only way I see Kellen Mond getting in a game. And here's the deal with Mond. 
Um, and I, I've been saying this since they drafted him, redshirt him for the year. And I think it is so much easier to develop the guy if he is as behind as Kellen Mond was. And I, I won't get into the detail. You can listen to a previous episode if you're interested in that. Um, but he's very far behind. Uh, he is he is not nearly as ready to play as any of the first round guys. That's why they were the first round guys. Um, and he is... He needs time to work out footwork problems, mechanical problems, problems with his reads. He needs to read everything just faster. He just needs to get more comfortable in general. He he's got, he needs a lot of work. He's a project quarterback. He was always going to be a project quarterback. We thought that before the draft. I thought that after the draft. I still think that. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But if there's no pressure at all, you go up to Cullen Mond every week and say, no, you're not even going to be active, dude. Just work on improving yourself. Don't worry about the Cowboys. Don't worry about the Chargers or the Ravens. Don't, you know, you don't need to worry about the Panthers coming up to this week. Just you worry about you getting better. And of course, he'll have some duties in preparation, helping Kirk Cousins prepare. All the backup quarterbacks have those duties and they're helpful duties to learn anyway. So I'll have that. But otherwise, uh, you know, you, you can take so much pressure off of him and let him develop in that way that, even in the situation where Kirk Cousins, you know, Achilles torn out for the year, right? Knock on wood, you know, blessings be unto thee. Um, but in even in that situation, you go, no, nope, it's Sean Mannion's show. And just no chance at all. Do not let Kellen Mond develop with the intention of playing this year. Let him develop with the intention of playing next year. And I think that's a much healthier mentality for a guy like Kellen Mond um, to be in. So even if they're mathematically eliminated... I just don't know if that's better for him until he is comfortable enough to truly operate an offense. I think about that uh, Justin Fields' first game where it was the one against the Browns, that really bad disaster. You might remember um, all the thoughts after that. Um, it was week three against the Browns. That is not a valuable learning experience. So until he can go in and operate a game at least reasonably, the live reps aren't going to help. They're just going to cause bad habits in him. So... That's my deal with Kellen Mond. I don't see a scenario where he's even activated in a game that doesn't also involve Kirk Cousins being, for one reason or another, unavailable to play in it. Skull Doctor says, why do you think the Vikings haven't used as much play action this year? Um, short answer is, that's Clint Kubiak's offense. Um, that's just He just has decided not to. He's not the only wide zone coach that has moved away from it. Um, and I think there's some interesting stuff going on there. So longer answer is because it takes longer to set up. Um, it's just, you know, turning around, faking, and then you have to turn back around. You had your eyes off of the read for a long time, so your read is behind. You have to read faster. Um, it's usually deeper drops, and that's harder on the offensive line, and they've had some offensive linemen they have to protect and stuff. So I think Clint Kubiak inherited an offense with a notoriously bad offensive line and said, eh, we're going to do straight drop timing stuff. Um, and I think that's defensible considering, I mean, he's trying to help out the offensive line. That's really the answer is the offensive line has been bad for 10 years, and they're doing something to try to help them. And I would say they've had three games of their six so far where the offensive line has been fantastic. And Arizona, it was great. In uh, uh, Against Seattle, it was great. And in this last one against uh, the Panthers, the pressure rate was really, really low. And I think time to throw has had a lot to do with that. And you don't get play action and quick releases. You kind of have to pick one or the other. They've chosen quick releases this year. And I think that's been a good choice. Herb P2O says, I have a feeling the Vikings are never trying to really block a punt, field goal, or extra point. Do you agree? And why is that? Um, I, I would have to go back and look at them to see if I agree with your assessment. But for now, I'll take your word for it that they aren't trying to. So the reason you would do that is to focus on punt coverage um, and, you know, focus on forcing fair catches um, or sorry, focus on uh, setting up non-fair catches, setting up good returns. Uh, you would focus on fakes uh, a lot of times you know the vikings have in some situations put their starting defense out there against a punt unit because they've sniffed out a fake and thought maybe they might fake one on us i want patrick peterson out there um r.i.p and uh so th that is part of it you know there's more goals to a punt play if you could guarantee a good return i would not care about blocking ever at all um, so I, I guess there's part of that. And on a field goal, you know, I, I don't know, you'd never block one anyways. So you might as well worry about the fake. I would much rather like if you could push a button that says you will never get fake field gold, but you will also never block one. Would you hit it? I think you'd think about it. Right. And that's kind of the decision that they're making right now, assuming that they're never trying to block one. Um, but it's also a thing where you kind of pick your spot. If you see a vulnerability on tape in the week leading up to the game, then you try to block one, um, or then you go for the fake. You know, if you catch him in a weird alignment or something like that, um, then, you know, go for it. But I would much rather, I, I think I agree with the idea of setting up better punt 
return blocking and set up for possible better returns than to set up for a better chance at blocking one. I feel like there's just more meat on the bone that way, but I'd probably have to look into it deeper and I don't hold that take with a lot of conviction. You could definitely change my mind on it if you wanted to. Last one comes from Scoliosis, who says, in referring to offense and defense, we often use the expression both sides of the ball. Given the orientation of the football at the line of scrimmage, shouldn't we be saying both ends of the ball? I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. There are two ends to every argument. I have nothing to add. Eh, good point. Uh, so tomorrow we're going to get deep into this. Tomorrow is kind of our deep dive day, our rewatch Wednesday. So if you're interested in some of the questions that I tabled during this, some of the things I couldn't really answer, I'll have answers hopefully for those things tomorrow. Um, and then we will get into some bye week stuff. We'll talk a little bit about when do you fire your head coach? We'll talk a little bit probably about Alexander Madison and Dalvin Cook is kind of a take I want to do a whole show on. and Some other things, we'll see what comes up. In the meantime, thank you so much for making Lockdown Vikings your first listen. Your second listen should be the Peacock and Williamson podcast. They're doing the national angle, Brian Peacock and Matt Williamson. Doing a great job over there. You can find that and this show free on all platforms. I will see you all tomorrow, and as always, Skull.